Hello everyone, so <clears throat> this video is about crimes of violence. Uh, anyway, the Offence Against the Person Act deals with most of these. Um, there is assault occasioning actually bodily harm under section 47, more serious is malicious wounding under section 50. Um, uh, okay, so then there's grievous bodily harm under section 18. So uh, let me look at uh, assault occasioning actually bodily harm. Occasioning in this case means causing. Um, so uh, the prosecution has to show the following, that there was common assault, that there was actual bodily harm, and that there is a causal link between the two. Um, it was the assault which caused the bodily harm. So common assault, um, I've talked about it already, but uh, remember there are two different types, there's the psychic assault and there's the physical assault. Um, there's battery, which is often called assault by beating, as in kicking, punching, hitting with an implement, um, uh, throttling, things like that. Uh, okay, so the prosecution will um, try and show that it's a section 47 offence um, and uh, prove that there was actual bodily harm that resulted um, either because the, the, the defendant um, uh, made physical contact or just um, frightened the person by threatening such contact. So then there's actually bodily harm. So um, uh, a judge named Swift in the case of Donovan 1934 gave the following definition. Any hurt or injury calculated to interfere with the health or comfort of the victim, such a hurt or injury need not be permanent, but must be more than merely transient or trifling. Close quotation. Um, so it's up to the jury to decide whether the hurt was actually bodily harm or not. If it's very minor, they might say, no, not actually bodily harm. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, it's got to be usually something like a scratch. It could be a, a contusion. Con that's usually a charge as common assault. So um, actually bodily harm um, uh, doesn't require injury to um, skin or anything like that, but often it is. Um, in one case, a woman's ponytail was cut off without her permission, and that was held to be actual bodily harm. That was in DPP against Smith in 2006. So a actual bodily harm, it includes psychiatric harm. In Chan Fook 1994, the Court of Appeal said um, this is not um, uh, merely shock or pain or panic. It has to be a named psychiatric condition. In Ireland and Burstow, two women suffered from a panic disorder, as in panic attacks and a depression, and that was because they'd been stalked by people. And this, is, this was held to be bodily harm. This satisfied both Section 47 and Section 20, the Offence Against the Person Act. So that case, Ireland, is authority for um, two uh, uh, beliefs we have in English law now, two doctrines. A telephone call, even if nothing is said and there's no sound on it, can be a common assault. The other one is that psychiatric injury is charged in exactly the same manner as a physical injury. There's actual bodily harm. So they're charged under Section 20. Remember, there's got to be a cause and effect relationship demonstrated. Um, so there's got to be um, a chain of causation between um, the thing that was done and the harm which resulted. A bit like with battery, that's very obvious. There's got to be no novus actus interveniens, which, which breaks the chain of causation. So in Roberts 1972, um, the defendant touched a woman on the knee, so she feared she was going to be sexually assaulted, so she jumped out of a moving car and thereby injured herself. So he's found, uh, was he found guilty? Yes, he was, um, because... It was not just common assault. He didn't cause the, 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 the injury. He said, I didn't, I didn't push her out of the car. She jumped out. But no, the court said that this was a normal reaction because what he did led her to jump out of the car. It was foreseeable that she might have done that. In Savage 1992, a court came to the same decision. Um, uh, well, the defendant, he tried to throw his beer over somebody's face in a pub, but his hand slipped and actually the glass went out of his hand and hit the person on the face and cut the person. So the House of Lords said that the prosecution doesn't have to convince the court that um, the defendant um, had foresight of the harm that was going to occur. So this is what the House of Lords he held. The verdict of assault, of actual, of occasionally actual bodily harm, may be returned upon proof of an assault verdict, together with proof of the fact the actual bodily harm was occasioned by the assault. Close quotation. So there's mens rea under section 47. So mens rea here requires there must be an intention and it must cause a certain person to believe that physical contact is going to come, some unlawful force. Um, okay, uh, You don't have to show the defendant intended or foresaw that any um, um, uh, physical injury would result or psychiatric injury, so long as we can demonstrate that um, uh, the person tried to cause the victim worry. So therefore, you can, you can prove guilt 
um, uh, if there's some foresight uh, of, of worry at least. You don't have to prove there's foresight of the actual harm that followed. In Savage, the remember the victim was just trying to throw beer, not the glass, but there ended up actually the glass going as well. So let's talk about um, <clears throat> malicious wounding and infliction of grievous bodily harm. So malicious wounding is the next one up. A, a man who pretended to be a doctor and injected people on that basis, he was found guilty of malicious wounding. So under Section 20 Defence Against the Person Act, it says the following. Um, an offence is committed where a defendant unlawfully and maliciously wounds or inflicts a grievous bodily harm upon another person, either with or without any weapon or instrument. So what's the actus reus here? So remember that um, 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 malicious wounding and grievous bodily harm are two separate things, um, but they are similar. So you can um, wound someone without causing them grievous bodily harm. So you can cause grievous bodily harm without wounding them. So um, anyway, uh, if you, um, uh, yeah, if you, if, you, if you cut someone's skin and cause them a lot of bleeding, then that's certainly wounding, possibly grievous bodily harm. If you hit someone on the head with a blunt instrument and, and, and fracture someone's skull, that uh, would be would be um, grievous bodily harm, even if you haven't broken the skin, even if there's been no bleeding. Um, uh, okay, so um, very minor wounds um, tend to be charged under Section 47. Anyway, there, there are many different injuries from things which are uh, very, very unserious up to things which are life-threatening. Um, and you can get a maximum of five years in prison for these. Okay, so wounding, it can't be simply a scratch or a graze. Um, uh, it's got to be both the dermis and the epidermis is broken to be a wound. Um, a br um, bruising is not a wound, even if there's internal blood loss. That's found in McLaughlin, 1838, or Eisenhower, 1948. In, in the latter case, the defendant um, shot somebody with an air gun, a pellet near the eye, there was a bruise and bloodshot eye. But uh, he, the person was charged under Section 20. But the actus reus was more like under Section 18. Um, <clears throat> so it wasn't <clears throat> serious enough to qualify as grievous. And it wasn't actually a wound because there, the skin was not broken. So um, inter internal rupturing of blood vessels is not a wound. This it would have been regarded as a Section 47 offence. The only exception here is um, if there's internal membranes around the mouth or the urethra, as in Waltham, 1849. So looking on to grievous bodily harm. So um, uh, commentators usually just, just don't look at the words grievous. Um, that you see grievous all through 18, the 1861 Act. Um, that doesn't help us very much. In DPP against Smith in 1961, grievous bodily harm was said to be really serious harm or injury. So is that useful? Look at Janjua, 1999. The Court of Appeal said that serious harm is a paraphrase of it. It's decent. Um, is the injury really serious or simply serious? That's up to the jury to determine. In Bolam 2003, the Court of Appeal said, um, deciding whether harm is serious enough, the jury should um, consider the person's age, the person's um, uh, health and so on, as well as the injury itself. And so one person might think it's serious or harm, another might say it's not. Um, so it depends what your job is. You know, <clears throat> if you break your toe and you're a ballerina, that might be serious. If you break your toe and then... You couldn't walk anyway because you're in a wheelchair permanently. That's not serious. So the um, uh, Crown Prosecution Service has got charging standards and they, 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 they gives guidance to people. Um, okay, serious wounds that are grievous bodily harm, breaking arms and legs, heavy beatings, making somebody unconscious for more than a few seconds. Um, anything which causes um, uh, permanent um, disfigurement. Okay, a serious loss of blood, anything which necessitates surgery. Grievous bodily harm um, includes um, sexually transmitted diseases, such as HIV, as in the case DICA 2004, and major psychiatric injury, as in Burstow 1997. Um, okay, so um, moving on just a little bit. Grievous bodily harm, it must be inflicted, as in, it, um, so there's not simply caused, all right? Um, uh, so, so check this out. You might think, oh, it's a gun or something like that, or a knife. Well... Um, it could be. It doesn't have to be with any weapon at all. Remember, under Section Twenty, so uh, some sort of harm, some sort of application of force. In Clarence, eighteen eighty-eight, a man um, copulated with his good wife. He passed a gonorrhea. That was consensual, but um, this was not grievous bodily harm. Yes, he caused he caused her to have this disease, but he hadn't inflicted it. So, um, it ha so it has to be in a harmful manner. Um, so, in, in but in Burstow, the case of Burstow, they said of overturned Clarence. 
in, in birthday the victim was followed by this person for a long time making a silent phone call sending a hate mail frightening her stealing her clothes so the victim suffered a depression as a result and that was regarded as actual bodily harm so the harm didn't actually involve any physical force whatsoever so there's so now that we don't really think there's much of a difference between inflicting harm and causing harm in Dika, this man, um, he had intercourse with a woman without telling her he was HIV positive. He had unprotected sex with her, and then she contracted the disease. So uh, that that was uh, he was sent to jail for that. If he'd uh, if he'd practiced uh, protected sex or he'd told her, I've um, got it, and she decided to go ahead anyway with unsafe sex, he would have been in the clear. Um, that's the difference between cause and inflict. So cause is a bit broader um, because you can cause harm by not doing something as well as by doing something. Um, so like not, not putting out a fire, you've accidentally started. In Bursto, uh, it's simply a um, matter of using the, the right words, really, causing serious harm. So the mens rea under section 20 um, in this offence against the person act is malice. So the, you must intend to cause the harm or the be subjectively reckless, as in Mowat in 1968. The Court of Appeal showed that you the defendant needs to intend or foresee the harm that the um, uh, that some harm is going to come to the victim, but you don't need to foresee how bad it's going to be. In Palmerton 1991, the House of Lords said Mowat is correct. The prosecution didn't need to show the defendant intended to foresaw the risk of harm resulted from shaking a child. It was convicted under Section 20. So on to wounding with intent. Under Section 18 of the, the, the um, Offence Against the Person Act, it says this, it, um, unlawfully and maliciously by any means whatsoever wound or cause any grievous bodily harm to any person with intent to do some grievous bodily harm to any person or with intent to resist or prevent arrest. So the big difference between um, this crime and Section 20 is the mens rea of Section 18 is specific intent. So where, whereas Section 20 can be committed um, intentionally or recklessly. So what's, the, what's actus reus here? You must remember there are two different behavioural aspects of this. Um, in section 18. The first one is wounding and the second one is causing grievous bodily harm. Sorry, inflicting I must say. So wounding. Wounding, remember you've got to break the skin. Um, uh, blood must flow, even a drop. So um, that was as in McLaughlin, 1838, or Eisenhower in 1984 about the, the air gun hitting near the eye but no actual bleeding. Um, okay, remember if it's around mucous membranes that's different though. And that was found in Waltham, 1849. So grievous bodily harm. So um, this, uh, remember, is, it can be STDs, as per DICA, psychiatric injury. How about grievous bodily harm? So um, we looked at this before. You've got to remember that um, uh, this can be, it can be caused by omission, a breach of duty. Pitwood 1902 was a case of this, or Instant 1893, or Evans 2009. So the mens rea is under Section 18. There's, there's ul An ulterior motive will suffice here. Um, it's serious because the wounding of the grievous bodily harm is you intended to do this. And the causing of the injury uh, is that you're trying to cause grievous bodily harm or, or um, uh, uh, to resist arrest, for example. So you have to intend grievous bodily harm. doesn't matter that the conduct element here could be a wound or grievous bodily harm. The prosecution must demonstrate the defendant wished to cause the victim grievous bodily harm. You can't prove that. Um, the intention was to, to resist or prevent arrest. So that if the, the defendant wounds the victim, but not se not seriously, the prosecution will not be able to prove it, okay? Unless they can show the intention was to cause a serious wound, even though a minor wound was caused. If the, the, then the wound might be grievous bodily harm. If the defendant wanted to cause the victim grievous bodily harm in another way, the prosecution has to show this was the level of injury that the defendant wished to cause. The jury will not usually be given the will and direction. Um, they are asked to decide, considering all the evidence, if the defendant only intended to do 